Hello and a warm welcome to Voice of Russia's political discussion program, Debating Russia. I'm Peter Lavelle. Just how content or discontent are Russians? Western media more times than not report on this country in the darkest of colors. In this program, we'll let poll numbers speak for themselves. To discuss this and more, I'm joined by Jonathan Steele in London. He's the international affairs commentator for The Guardian. We also have uh, Daria Malutina. She's a researcher at UCL. And Ludmila Presnyakova here in Moscow with me. She's the director of research project at the Public Opinion Foundation. Earlier this month, the All-Russian Center for Public Opinion Research claimed that 76% of Russians are happy. The number of people who say they are happy has grown 32% since 1990, from 44% to 76%. Jonathan, if I can go to you first. I've lived in Russia for 15 years, and complaining is a national pastime. And I usually gauge people on how unhappy they are, but we have a poll that says three-quarters of them are happy. Are you surprised? Well, I'm not surprised by the difference between 1990. I think that's the relevant thing. 1990 was a particularly bad year. It was a year before the Soviet Union collapsed. There was all this parade of sovereignties, nationalism rising everywhere. The economy was in a very bad state. There were huge queues for food and other items which were completely short in the shops and so on. So it's a really bad year. So the fact it's better than that is not really a surprise. But I would honestly like to know more about these details. How do you define happiness? I mean, just to give one statistic is not enough. What was the measure of happiness? Well, that's why we have... That's why we have- Dottie and Ludmilla on the program. They're going to tell us a little bit probably what makes people happy because that's uh, that's the obvious question I asked myself when I read these numbers here. It's interesting that almost the same number of people said they were happy in 2008, right before the financial crisis. So that's kind of interesting as well. Dottie, is the year 1990, is this what it's all about? Not about happiness? I'm with Jonathan on this topic. I mean, these data, the way they were presented, they were not surprising to me at all. And on top of that, it was not informative to compare 1990 and 2013. And uh, I mean, if, if, if they had compared the data from 2013 and the data from mid-1990s, they would have got an even more striking result. And I think, yeah, the, the, the main okay. question is, how do you measure happiness? Because it's a, it's a very difficult thing to measure. Okay, Ludmilla, you're sitting here with me. Oh, I mean, okay. are, you su- are you surprised by those numbers? Three quarters. And, and I want to spread this out a little bit. I, I don't think there's a lot of countries, and particularly in the developed world, where three quarters of the people say they're happy today. Go ahead. You know, on one hand, I am surprised, and on the other, I'm not, because the tendency is really uh, the right people become more satisfied and less discontent and more happy. But if to say about the measure, it's really very difficult to measure happiness, and there are different uh, methods around the world. And as to talk about uh, this certain research, the question that was asked people sounded like there may be good days in the life, (laughs) bad times, and in general, can you say that you are a happy person? And actually, it was the poll of the other company, of uh, Tseom, uh, all-Russian poll research company, and uh, my company also made the same research. We asked the question in uh, in other words, can you say about yourself that you are a happy person? And we received 64%, a little less than Tseom, but it's still a a big number. Yes, it's a big number. And you know, I think that when people answer such questions, they don't mean really that they are happy, they are smiling every moment, and, and they are full of joy. They just mean that they are not unhappy, and they just uh, well, mean a, that... That's uh, a very good point, Jonathan, because I think that that's what I also drew from these numbers, is the level of unhappiness, not happiness. Because, mm-hmm. again, living here for 15 years, complaining about this and that is a national pastime. There's You can't avoid a conversation where somebody's complaining about something, about the prices, <laughs> about the weather, about the metro, about immigration. And we can talk about how happiness and unhappiness deal with politics. But again, you know, Jonathan, for most Russians, it's the indicator of unhappiness, not happiness. Well, I mean, if the question was the one that you've just said, are you a happy person? It sounds as though you're asking people about their character, not about their attitude. Mm to life in Russia at the moment and its politics, its economics, yeah. its security. I mean, you say to somebody, are you a nice person? You'll get 90% people saying they're nice people. <laughs> People are not going to say, I'm unhappy, I'm an unhappy person. The, the, the public persona that almost everybody likes to give is that they are nice people, they're, they're happy. And well, do you think do you think that question made any sense in 1990? Ludmilla, you wanted to jump in here, because if you say, are, are you happy, whatever that means, in 1990, most people said they weren't. Yes, actually, this question, it grabs something, some, some attitude also. It's not only a social attitude, it's not only just uh, an idea to show that I'm a good person, I'm a nice person. 
Actually, in Russian culture, it is a little different attitude to declaring of your happiness. You say, for example, about a lot of complaints to everything, to every point of the life, yes? In Russia, culture is very jealous. And when you say that you are happy, you are okay, you are perfect, you immediately become an object of somebody's jealousy. So in culture, it is not right to say aloud, I'm happy. Well, you can ask so the question, this, can't you? This is, uh, you can this ask is, the question if you're happy. Mm -hmm. Daria, if I can go to you in London. Being a Russian, what is the measure of happiness in your mind when it comes to Russian culture and society? Yeah, I think that the one of, one of the main reasons that people get discrepancies between the Russian data and the Western data is because of the semantic differences of the word happiness. So mm -hmm. in, in Western terms, it is understood more as a life satisfaction in general. But in Russian, the word happiness means something completely different. Not completely, but something like, more. Like, for example? Um, it's something more, more, it has more to do with the spiritual side of life or whatever. I don't know if Ludmilla agrees with me. I'm agreed to some extent, but we asked people what do they mean by the word happiness. And uh, they say that uh, the first is the health of themselves and their relatives. Yeah, yeah. The second is the family, children, and the well-being of the family. So it's concept of private life and well-being in your oh. private life and but that close always, But that circle. always conflates with the outer reality. Jonathan, I, mean, mm -hmm. I, I think the primary reason why I wanted to do this program is because, again, I keep reiterating, I mean, I never think of saying that they're happy because it's to what degree they're not unhappy. Uh, but Jonathan, there is a pronounced, profound change that has happened in this country over the last 20 years because even asking the question happiness now is getting closer and closer to what you and I probably as Westerners would understand that word to mean. Well, I did look up some international comparisons before we came on the program and I don't think Russia unfortunately does very well on that. I mean, the OECD, the Organization for European Economic Cooperation and Development in Europe, does a study of, you know, all the major countries and they put Australia as being the happiest country with the highest index of happiness. The US is number six, Britain is only 16, and Russia is 32. It's not very good. And then I looked up Columbia University's Earth Institute, which also has a happiness index. And uh, Russia was 68 down there. Britain was down at 22. China was worse than Russia. China was down at 93 in terms of happiness. So I, I don't think Russia is doing terribly well. And so we shouldn't be too complacent about that. Well, I'm not being complacent. What I'm just saying is the comparison, and you rightfully pointed out, 1990 is a pretty, uh, it's, 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 it's almost a straw man if you want to take it face value too much. Ludmilla, you want to jump in again? Go ahead. Um, uh, anyway, all this cross-cultural research, they have the same reason as this data of uh, Russian polls, yes, because in every country there is their own cultural connotation of the term of happiness. So I would I would rather pay attention to the dynamics because we are asking the same question, yes, uh, 12 years ago and now, and we have some dynamics to the same question, to the same stimuli. So uh, I would like to um, really track your attention uh, uh, to this growth of the index. It doesn't matter how it's measured. And really from uh, the 90s, 90s, there are many reasons why why Russian people become feeling uh, really happier and also subjective and objective. For example, uh, there was a very interesting presentation of Russian economist Sergei Guriev, as you know, who just immigrated to Paris. Uh, last year he made a presentation uh, for the open government and uh, there was um, data uh, that the growth of Russian uh, GDP correlate with the index, one of the indexes of happiness of the population. So really there are reasons, uh, not, not only financial reasons in our country, for people become feeling better, more comfortable, less discontent and so far. You're listening to Voice of Russia's political discussion program, Debating Russia. I'm Peter Lavelle. Dottie, if I can yeah. uh, continue what Ludmila was saying, is it, I mean, a, a, again, I guess maybe one of the, the easiest things, and because I think the term happiness is very relative depending on where you are and I, I don't know anything about what it means to be happy in China, not at all. But I think that if we took the GDP index and, and disposable income, that's something that you can start correlating and, and correlate it to what it might mean to be happy. Because we, there's no doubt in anyone's mind that Russia's economy since 1990 has grown enormously. Yeah, I would like to add something because there is such a discipline which is called happiness economics. And there is such a, one of the, one of the key elements of the theory is the so-called Stalin paradox, which means that increases in real GDP are not necessarily accompanied by increasing happiness. Mm -hmm. So income is correlated to the happiness level, but not very straightforwardly, which means that income has a large impact on happiness only until the point that the basic needs are satisfied. So it is strongly correlated mm -hmm. with happiness until it reaches the certain level. And then the correlation 
situation becomes weaker. Actually, now it's a questionable point because there are new research that uh, prove that it's linked more directly. And there is no that up level of uh, $20,000 for a person, which was uh, indicated in the 70s. So income is really related. It's interesting. I, I absolutely agree with Daria because there's a certain point where material needs or not is mm-hmm. highly important. But Jonathan, living in, in this country for 15 years, the Russians are not nearly close to that level. I mean, the desire to consume yes. is insatiable still. No, I'm sure that's uh, absolutely yeah. right. Let's go to Jonathan, go ahead. I mean, but I think these bold GDP figures often disguise uh, income inequality within a society. I mean, mm-hmm. I think Russia is still quite an unequal society at yeah. some level. It was less unequal, and ironically, in the Soviet period. The elite mm-hmm. was much smaller and people were more or less living pretty much the same standard of living. Now I think there are huge disparities of income. Now whether that means people are more or less unhappy is another matter, but it's not just about income, it's also about opportunity. You know, if you feel you are free mm-hmm. to develop your opportunities and your talents and so on, and you have a choice of career and a choice of where to live, and, and I think those things also matter a great deal. And uh, it's certainly yes. true that Russia is freer than it was in 1990, and certainly than it was in 1970 or 1950. But uh, I think there are still issues of uh, opportunity which need to be addressed. Daria, you want to jump in there, follow up on Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Well, first of all, GDP is not the same as, like, real personal income. And I agree with John on this, that, that it is a country of huge inequalities. And expectations, uh, life expectations, uh, in, in many research on happiness, they play a significant role. So happiness is understood mm-hmm. as related to expectations and the level of fulfillment of these expectations. I mean, again, following what, what Dottie just said, I mean, if, if three quarters of the population say they're happy, however we define that, and we include what Dottie had just said about expectations, then there's still a sense that there is more to go around. The economy will grow. And I want want to turn this into a political question pretty soon, getting closer and closer Mm -hmm. to it. But, I mean, expectations are still there. I mean, and high expectations, I would say. Uh, yes, yes, the expectations also becomes higher during this period, really, in uh, many spheres, in, in economics, in uh, consumer behavior and so far. For example, we measure, uh, you, you probably know this uh, index of consumer satis- sentiment. And uh, now, last three, four years, it's uh, expectations and uh, estimation of the current situation. They both are very close to each other, mm-hmm. and they are close to the uh, middle point, when the negative and positive answers so are, they're, the, they're, are balanced. They're flat. Out. Yes, it, mm-hmm. they are very close to each other. So, uh, and it is a really unique uh, situation for our country because um, they were very high expectations. Uh, uh, by the way, expectations were higher, and the estimation of real situation were lower. So they are coming closer to each other now in this <laughs> middle point. It's good. Uh, we can we compared our uh, index of consumer sentiment to Americans, and now in Russian we have it higher. Mm-hmm. So uh, expectations are also higher. And I would also add not only what Jonathan said. Also, adaptation to a new economy, to this market economy, because in the early 90s, people were disorientated in professional sphere very seriously. And since that moment, of course, uh, everybody uh, adopted and now feel comfortable more or less uh, in these circumstances. That's why also made people uh, feeling more stable, more sure. And political stability. Yes, well, we'll get to political stability. Mm-hmm. Jonathan, it's one of the things that I think a lot of people, our listeners, may not understand is the what happened to Russia in the 1990s. It was, as one colleague of mine said to me, it was like a the Great Depression in the United States, except for it was two times worse, three times worse. Mm-hmm. How does this impact the psyche of the Russians that you knew? And how does it impact the psyche of the Well, government? I think the issue of stability is very important, and I suppose that feeds into expectations. R- Russians uh, have been used to tremendous shocks at various periods in their history, mm-hmm. two foreign invasions, a revolution, and so on. And uh, then we had in 1990, the year that we started talking about, was... Uh, a year of incredible instability. But then there was the shock of 1992 when the prices were so-called released or liberated overnight and huge inflation. People lost their savings, lost their pensions and wages went down. So that was one shock. Then there was 2008, the bank crash and so on. A lot of people then again lost their savings, which they'd been told under market economy they could put into a bank who would earn interest, etc., etc. So that was a big shock. But since 2008, it has been much more stable. So I think there is an expectation Mm -hmm. in Russia that, that things are relatively stable. And I think there is a bit of a difference here between Russia and the West. I think in the West, younger people, looking at it in terms of generations, think that they may not be as well off as their parents, and may even be worse off than their parents. So that the idea that 
gradually over time you, you, you're bound to be better off is not uh, any longer you know, held by a lot of people because there's so much unemployment, particularly of young people and of graduates. Even though they've got the best training available in their societies, they still can't get a job. Whereas in Russia, I think uh, there perhaps is a still a feeling that uh, among the younger generation that they will live better than their parents. This is the Voice of Russia broadcasting from the heart of London. From Monday to Friday, we're live here on digital from 4 p.m. until 8. We're also online at ruvr.co.uk. Tune in for current affairs, news, arts and debate. And Daria, isn't that an interesting question of political stability? Because the economy in Russia right now, is growth is flat. Um, and again, going back to this concept of happiness, however we define it here, this turns into a real political issue because we have a, a ruling political elite that has basically been able to deliver the goods, if I can put it that way, for the last 12 years, 13 years. Now it's getting a bit tougher. The sense of happiness here is something the current, current political leadership has to be very attuned to. I mean, I mean, I think that this only sort of proves my point that wealth matters only until a certain point. And uh, quite a lot of Western indexes of happiness actually include the, the political stability and the freedom and the, 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 the level of democ- the function of democratic institutions in the countries in, in their assessment of happiness. So I think that, that that will also matter at some point for Russia. Lidmila, you know, we look at happiness as something that people want, strive towards. How have Russians changed over the last, since 1990, in terms of values? What's important to them? Like I said, Russians still like to shop, okay? I don't see any change in that at all in the time I've lived here. But what are some of the other changes going on in society? Uh, In terms of values, there are changes, and there are real and big changes. People uh, become more concentrated on private life and individual changes, individual values. But, you know, that very stability is (laughs) really one of the main, main, main values for or even all strata of the society. I, I would like to point here that when we talk about the changes of Russia, it's very difficult to, 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 to speak about all Russians. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Russia is yeah. very different. And um, I would like uh, to tell a few words about Natalia Zubarevich concept of four Russias. She, uh, she is an economical geographer and she divided, um, strati- stratificated the country into four different types. Uh, one is um, the most modern uh, part, uh, which uh, covers megapolises and post industrial sector of economy. The other is the so-called second Russia, it's industrial economy and uh, smaller, uh, big towns uh, and a little bit smaller. The third Russia is um, villages and uh, small city, small small towns. It's a very conservative and I think that it's the less happy and less satisfied uh, part of... But, but is uh, that because of geo... I'm sorry, because of economic reasons? Because Mainly because of economic reasons and because of uh, chances and opportunities and um, opportunities um, to get any uh, anything to, to build career to get money to to plan your life and so far so it's uh, the most depressed part uh, of the country and it's about one third of the country okay it's Jonathan I, I've I, I, oh. and the fourth is oh, national sorry, republics <laughs> yes and all these four stratas it has a different uh, system of values and uh, the most uh, important changes are in first Russia uh, it, it is that part of Russia that adopted the modern Western I'd say uh, um, shapes of uh, values and all, all this set is uh, you may find in uh, the system of values of modernized uh, person <laughs> Jonathan if I go back to you in London I, I always thought we think, well, I've been told um, repeatedly there are only two Russias. There's Moscow and everybody else. Um, Four. And, and, <laughs> sometimes there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, Jonathan, uh, you know, if we if we think of um, happiness as something we want to strive toward, how do you turn this into politics? I mean, we see the maturation of the economy. We have, you've pointed out very clearly, of expectations. We have um, uh, 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 prof- new professional classes, a new middle class. It's um, pretty vibrant, but um, it, it's keeping it, it's keeping an eye on its pocketbook over the, at least at the time being, maybe over the next year. But how does this turn into politics and civil society, in your opinion? 
Well, I think there is still an, an alienation between the, the population and the government. I think this is traditional in Russia. So I'm not quite sure that I agree with the point Lyudmila made that, that there is now a sort of reversion to private life and the private sphere. You know, I used to go to Russia a lot in the Soviet period, and again, it was exactly the same thing. People would sit around the kitchen and they would have their private life and their friends and there'd be solidarity among mm-hmm. neighbours and so on, but they'd be completely divorced from politics. And I think this, that is the same so very much in Russia now. There's a big gap between us and them. They will do what they want. They are impervious to our ideas. They yes. will, you know, run the economy as they see fit. They will enrich themselves, and we are just down here. Wait, wait. Well, but, but that kind of begs the point, doesn't it, Jonathan? It doesn't really matter what political system there is in Russia. People get to still sit in the kitchen and complain. Yeah, that's, that's right. But I think, I think it's a pity because I think uh, one wants a, vi- a vibrant society is one where people feel they are citizens and not subjects. I mean, in Britain, we used to be called subjects of Her Majesty. Now we increasingly call ourselves citizens. But I think Russians still feel that they are pawns in some bigger game that they really have little control over. Danny, does that make any difference to, you think, average Russians if their life is good, is how, depending on how they define it? I mean, I, the reason why I ask that question is because I see it all of the time. Um, Jonathan, you probably probably would not be surprised that, you know, I lived in Eastern, I lived in Eastern Europe, and then uh, we were both in Poland, I think, in the 1980s um, uh, at, at one point. And then living in Russia for so long, I always find that it's a very small group of people, and a lot of them are foreigners living here that talk about Russian politics. But most Russians don't have much interest in politics, and ir- irrespective of these uh, demonstrations that we've seen over the last two years uh, that's still not very uh, clearly not representative society. So, I mean, Daria, is, is this sense of happiness go into the political realm? Well, um, I sort of agree and don't agree with you on okay. this point because, I, well, first of all, I still think there is this old, old, old school kitchen culture that is still at work in mm. Russia and that Moscow is clearly not Russia and uh, outside the capital city you would mostly encounter the traditional kitchen culture and villagers and uh, apolitical people. But at the same time, this strata of uh, young, educated people with Western values, liberal-minded, or maybe not so liberal-minded, by, but then again, oppositionally-minded people, is growing. And that's what the protests of 2011-2012 yes. did show us. Mm-hmm. And that's definitely a in trend Moscow, in the primarily. society, primarily in Moscow and in big cities. That's a trend. Yes. Maybe there's not so many of them, but that's definitely a trend. And you well, I'd like to I'd point out, I went to almost all of those protests, and I would certainly want um, our uh, listeners to know that not all of them are liberal. Okay? Not all of them, of them are liberal, are, yeah. Are, yeah. Very, mm-hmm. are very mm-hmm. nasty people, to be honest yes. with you. You're listening to Voice of Russia's political discussion program, Debating Russia. I'm Peter Lavelle. Lyudmila, can you speak to that? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm quite agree. Uh, really, this is a trend, and uh, this uh, strat- this um, number of such people, it's growth. And uh, uh, I would also argue with the idea that uh, this kitchen uh, style is continuing. Actually, no. People who are, um, especially from second and third Russia, who are who feels uh, quite a politics and who feels that um, government uh, is doing something uh, their own and people live by by their own they they don't even uh, talk about politics in the kitchen <laughs> I, will, I can give an example uh, a typical um, speech in the kitchen with my relatives uh, I have an aunt uh, and an uncle who lives in uh, a, smarry, a, a very small um, uh, city in Pavolgia a small town. It was a um, chemical plant there or something like this. A uh, few years ago, they were talking about uh, pensions, they were talking about politics, they were talking about Zuganov and so far. Uh, now we are discussing uh, internet, uh, browsers and so far. <laughs> so they turned, uh, people turns uh, their focus from politics to the private sphere more and more. Uh, so in, in, in this sense, uh, there's really a big uh, yeah, gap. But th- I think that's interesting because you can kind of invert all of it, John. Jonathan, I mean, this is one of the things that I, I've always thought about Russian politics, and, and, and a lot of Westerners, particularly Western journalists, have disagreed with me. Mm-hmm. But it's because people feel like they don't have to think about politics, because there is a sense of stability, there isn't a crisis. Yes. Um, and I think this is, the, you know, it, it, people say, oh, poor, the poor Russians, they're apolitical. But I think a lot of Russians that I've come across over the years just are happy as can be not to have to think about politics, because there's no, in their mind, there's nothing fundamentally wrong. 
Yes. Let me, let me go to Jonathan. Well, no, I mean, I think stability is, is very important uh, for, for everybody anywhere in, the, in any country. Um, and 1990 and the 90s in general were very an era of great instability. And we've had now a decade of, of relative stability. So I think people, if people are not interested in politics, it, it can mean in, to some extent they're satisfied that there won't be any more shocks. But it can also mean that they're they don't think they can influence things. So what's the point about talking mm-hmm. about something you can't influence? Ludmilla, you want to jump Actually, in Actually, uh, a big part of the population don't want to influence influence anything. Uh, paternalism is still very typical for Russian political consciousness. Well, so, so you're saying, if I can, I can just kind of uh-huh. uh, uh, paraphrase it, uh, people are interested in the, um, the fruits of the market system of capitalism but they're not interested so much in the political side. It's it's yes. is it it's well that yes that, that can is. turn into a train wreck eventually if you if you divorce them for too long. Daria, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, I agree. I think Russians still lack the culture of uh, political participation of uh, the culture of civic engagement on grassroots level. Uh, that's what many mm-hmm. Western countries do have, and what Russians are now developing. I hope so. Yes, yes, I agree. Really, people just don't need, um, don't feel the need to participate. Yes. I, excluding this modern class, uh, the so-called creative class or mid, upper middle class, and who but protested. Do you think, are they, and, reflective, you know, are they we, reflective of Russian values, of a greater Russia? Because, uh, you know, I, I think I've come across the people you're talking about, and they're mm-hmm. much more directed towards the West and no. not towards the development of Russia. Go ahead. Uh, less part of the population is uh, turned to the Western... That's what I'm saying. I'm, yes, but I'm saying a very yes. small mm-hmm. group of yes, people. Yes, yes, it's a very small group. But, you know, uh, participation uh, is not only in political sphere, is uh, development. Uh, all this um, civic um, civic society and all the sec- action uh, help to each other in critical situation. Um, and all, you know, initiative... Not political initiative, not political activism is uh, growing now, and I think that it is very good um, symptom. Okay. Very, very good. All right, we're almost out of time here. I want to ask all three of my guests here, Jonathan. What would make you happy to see happen in Russia? <laughs> I think I would agree with our other speakers. <laughs> more political participation, more civic participation, more sense that they can influence things, that they belong, and that they can to some extent, not just control their own careers and lives, but can control the environment in which they live and the community in which they live. Daria, well, yeah, what I, would make I, you happy? Yeah, I'm with Jonathan on this point. And also what would make me happy, the better functioning and more democratic institutions and more transparent politics in Russia. Okay, and Lyudmila, I'm going to give you the last word. What would, you, what would make you personally happy to see happen in Russia? I think that um, I think uh, that there should be a dialogue between two uh, between different parts of the society because now the main problem is uh, that uh, everybody follows its own values and uh, don't um, estimate others. So the dialogue, the well, understanding. Ludmilla, you've just given me an idea for another program of debating <laughs> Russia. I want this is uh, this program made me very happy. Jonathan, <laughs> Daria, and Ludmilla sitting here with me in Moscow in Voice of Russia's studio. Uh, thank you very much for joining me here on Voice of Russia's Debating Russia. I'm Peter Lavelle. Stay with VOR. Listening to the voice of Russia from the heart of London. On weekdays, we broadcast live from 4 p.m. until 8 p.m. We're bringing news, current affairs, features, and debate. Now you can listen to us on digital radio and online. Visit ruvr.co.uk.